Good morning. <clears throat> I usually say when I get up here that it's a good thing to have an opportunity to speak, and I mean that. I think it's important that, and I think we do really good with that, with young and old here at Sandyville, of picking up and carrying the load whenever it's needed to be done, and many of us here do that. Whenever there's something needs to be done that maybe someone else would normally do, we'll pick up and take up that slack. I, I was thinking about that, and this is not really related to the lesson, but I found a humorous story about that um, that I'd like to share with you because it gives us some perspective on how important it is that we all do our job. Uh, the story goes there was this out-of-towner that drove his car into a ditch in a desolated area, in a rural area, remote. And a local farmer comes up on him, and he has this big old strong horse with him, big old huge horse. Horse's name is Buddy. Anyway, he helps this guy out of the ditch. He helps, he hitches Buddy up to his car, and then the farmer yells, pull, Nelly, pull. Buddy didn't move. Then he hollers, pull, Buster, pull. And Buddy didn't move. And then he yells, pull, Coco, pull. And Buddy didn't move. And then the farmer says, just kind of real calm, pull, Buddy, pull. And the horse pretty easily drags his car out of the ditch. Well, the motorist was very appreciative, but he was also very curious. He's like, why did you call the horse by his wrong by the wrong name three times before you call him by the right name and you pull it out of the ditch? And the farmer said, Well, Buddy's blind, and if he thought he was the only one pulling, he wouldn't even try. <laughs> now, what that tells us is that it's important that we all do our part. And I think that we do a great job with that here. And that especially comes when we're trying to reach the lost. And that's what the lesson's about this morning, is about the lost. And I'd like to look for the bulk of our lesson in Luke 15. The scripture reading came from Luke 19, but we're going to be looking at Luke 15. And this is what we might call, or some call, the lost chapter. This is where we see the parables of the lost son, or the prodigal son, the lost coin, the lost sheep. And these are very valuable lessons for us, and we've looked at these lessons many times. We've studied these wonderful lessons for many years. And these lessons give us examples of how God cares for lost people and wants to see them come to him. All of these parables give us this example. We have a shepherd who lost his sheep, we have a woman who lost her coin, and a father who lost his son. And these give us great models of perseverance and forgiveness. All three of these show us the importance of persevering to keep finding that lost coin or lost sheep or lost son. And the value of forgiveness that we see in the father of the lost son. But I'd like to look at these lessons from a little bit different viewpoint this morning. Because we're going to be talking about the lost. I want to look at that sheep that was lost at the coin that was lost, at the son that was lost. We know what the reactions of the shepherd and of the woman were and of the father. But what about the ones who were lost, or in the case of the son, the one who had sinned and was lost? Whenever we look at it, we're going to see this morning that from these lessons we can see four maybe slightly different types of lost people, four types of lost people. All of these lost people are those people that need our help, though. So, first let's look, if you would with me, beginning in verse 8 of Luke 3, sorry, Luke 15. And let's look at that lost coin for a minute. Now it says there, beginning in Luke 15, verse 8, Either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it? And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. 
Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repented. This lost coin itself, and it's a coin, but this lost coin itself represents a sinner. This would be the sinner who is lost but doesn't even know it. Now, a coin is a coin. It's a piece of metal. It's an object. It doesn't have a soul. We realize that. But a coin, when it's lost, it doesn't know that it's lost. Whether it's laying on a table or it's laying under a couch or it's laying under a car seat or whether it's buried in a box in a closet somewhere, it may be lost from the person who wants to find it, but it doesn't even know that it's lost. And men can be like this coin. Some people can be like this coin. They are people who are lost, but don't even know that they're lost. We might say they're out of circulation, like that coin. They don't have any feelings about the matter of being saved or lost. Or at least they don't express any feelings about it. They're like the coin who has no feelings. Maybe the lost people that are in this situation feel like that they are safe. And I think that many of our friends and neighbors are like this coin. Many of our friends feel this way. They either think they're okay or they maybe don't care anything about religion or about their spiritual state. But what it's our job to do is to make them aware of their spiritual state. You know, that coin was lost. And the woman we read about in the scriptures had ten pieces of silver and lost one and she swept the house, lights a candle, in other words, looks in all the dark places, and she sought diligently till she found it. She didn't look for 10 minutes. She didn't look for 15 minutes and give up. But she continued to look and swept the house till she found it. It makes me think of someone who maybe even moves all the furniture, everything they have, trying to find this coin. And that's the way we need to feel about those who are lost but don't even know it. They don't realize the danger that they're in. Just like that coin didn't realize they were lost. I've maybe mentioned this before, maybe from up here I've mentioned this before, but many years ago, about probably about 15, 14, 15 years ago, we had some chocolate candy in the house. I think they were chocolate reindeers, but anyway. We had some chocolate candy in the house that the person who lives in my house that I'm not going to mention had hid to keep away from children till we were ready to eat them. We never found those reindeers. She hid them so good she never found them. We have no idea where they ended up. We looked for them for many years. We weren't going to eat them after all those years, but we still looked for them because it was driving us crazy. But we never found them. And you know, the fact is we looked for a short time and then we quit looking for them. And then we come back to them and quit looking for them. And then we come back to them and quit looking for them. <coughs> but they were lost. And I suppose because we didn't sweep the house and turn the house completely upside down, we never found them. That's the way it is with the lost sinner who is lost and don't even know it. It's our job to find them and to help them find their way and help them realize that they're lost. You know, many people have the feeling that if you're a good person, that's fine, you're going to go to heaven. That's a, that is a feeling of many people, not a small amount of people. We need to make them understand that, yes, it is important to be a good person, but it's also important to be obedient to God and to his word. So let's help find those people. That lost coin, the one who's lost and doesn't even know that they're lost. If we look back in Luke 15 at the previous parable that Jesus gave us there, he talked about a shepherd who had lost his sheep. Beginning in verse 4 of Luke 15, says there, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying, Unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. 
Again, whenever we look at this story, we see Jesus speaking here, and he talks about the importance of one that is lost, leaving 99 in the wilderness to find the one. We don't really think this way a lot of the times. We would be concerned about the, well, we've lost one, we'll just hang on to the 99 that we've got and don't worry about the one. But angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner that repents. More than 99 just persons. That doesn't mean that they don't rejoice over the 99 just persons as well. But that one that is lost and is found is a call for joy and a call for celebration. And normally when we look at this story, we think about the shepherd who <coughs> searches for the lost sheep as an example of perseverance, and it is. But what about this sheep? What made this sheep go astray? I'm not an expert on sheep. I hear many people tell me that sheep are not very smart. I don't know that. But it seems to me that the sheep went astray because it left his master. And that's what happens with those who leave God and stray away into sin. Now, this sheep, whenever they get lost, they know that they're lost. They know that they can't find their shepherd. And they know they can't find their shepherd. So this sheep represents the type of lost person, the type of lost soul, that knows the way, that they're lost. They understand that they're lost. But they don't know the way home. The sheep in this situation gets confused and gets anxious. They know something's wrong. They know something's amiss. But they can't find their way. And they'll stray more and more further away and get more and more lost. So this represents the person that's lost and knows they're lost. They know they need to find God. They know there's something wrong in their life. But they don't understand how to get to God. And they need taught. They need led to the safety of the fold. And that's where we come in again. It's our job to show them the way home. They're not quite like that lost coin. That lost coin didn't even know they're lost. But these are the ones that sincerely understand that they need to find God. And they're seeking to find God. But they don't know the way. Now we may know some people like that as well. Ones that maybe they've even been in a denomination for many years, but they realize it's just something not right with what they're doing, with their spirituality. They know there's something not quite right with how they're worshiping God, with how they're living their life, and they want to find God. That's another type of the lost that we can help, like that lost sheep. Now, the shepherd left the 99, found that sheep, and searched diligently for that sheep. I get a picture whenever I think of that, of that shepherd going over hills, rocky areas, maybe even up on mountains, trying to find this sheep, <clears throat> and searching and searching and searching until they finally find that sheep. And then he doesn't just lead it home, but he carries it home, like the shepherd did in the story. And that's what we may need to do too. We need to teach them, show them the way home, help them find the way to God, and carry them along the way sometimes. But it's our job to get them on that right way. The person who knows they're lost, they know there's something wrong, but they can't quite find the way. So we find them, we teach them from the scriptures lovingly, and bring them to the fold. Well, then we get to the familiar story in Luke 15, maybe the, probably the most familiar story. We often call it the prodigal son. Some call it the lost son, and that's exactly what it is, a son that was lost. We're going to take a look at this scripture first, and then we'll see that there's two lessons we can learn from this. Beginning in verse 11 of Luke 15, it says here, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give to me the portion of goods that falleth to me, and he divided them under, his, under them his living. And not many days after, the young son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, 
there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said unto his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of these servants, one of the servants, and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come. And thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry, and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said unto his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid, that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, thou which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead, and is alive again, and was lost, <coughs> excuse me, and is found. Thank you for bearing with me reading that passage. But when we see Jesus' teaching here, we often think about this father, and we should. What a great example of love and forgiveness this father had. What a great example of patience and love. And an example of not giving up and searching diligently and waiting for his son to come back. Surely praying for his son to come back. But let's think about that lost son for a minute. <coughs> He represents a type of sinner. This lost son would be the one that knows they're lost and knows the way home, but wouldn't come home, at least at first. He knows he's he knows he's not where he's supposed to be. He knew he wasn't where he was supposed to be. He knew he should have come home, but sin and pleasure pulled him away from God. Sin and pleasure tempted him, and he went away from God and strayed and wasted his living, it says there in the scriptures. But after the suffering that he went through, the famine, having to feed swine, which was an ultimate insult for a Jew, and then wanting desperately so much to eat that he wanted to eat the pig slop, after coming to himself and realizing what sin and pleasure had done to him, how far away he was from his father, he chose to come home. Just like when the erring Christian comes home. It's a great time of rejoicing. But sometimes we have the sinner who knows that they're lost and knows the way home but will not. Now this son, this lost son, came home, he made the right decision in the end. But sadly, some will not make the right decision in the end. Or some refuse to make the right decision. But the lesson we need to learn from this is not to lose heart. That father didn't lose heart. 
And I get the impression from the story that that father still would have been looking for that son if it had been 15 years, 20 years, 25 years, 50 years later. He'd have still been looking for that son, just as God, when we stray away, still looks for us and won't stop looking for us. Whether it's a short amount of time or a long amount of time. So, the lesson we learn here is not to lose heart. To continue to implore them to come home. You know, many times this is a situation where we will say, well, you know, they know better. They, they know the scriptures. They know they're in the wrong place. They know better. They know they should come. So they really don't need taught, per se. They need encouragement and motivation to come back. They need maybe someone to shake them up a little bit and make them realize and what a dire situation they're in. In the case of the Aryan Christian, we can find in the scriptures where God has laid out plans of discipline to try to bring them back. But for the non-Christian who maybe knows about God and his gospel, knows the plan of salvation, knows they're lost, and knows how they can come to God, but simply refuses to, That's where we come in with prayer, with love, with encouragement for what they need. Many of us probably know people that <coughs> maybe know the scriptures, know the plan of salvation, maybe they've even attended church with us, or we've taught them with Bible study, and they know what they need to do, and they simply haven't done it yet. Many of us may know those. Many of us may know those who were Christians at one time but are erring and left the church. Either way, they fall into this category of the lost who know they're lost and know the way home. But as we still, well, even though they know all this, it's still our responsibility to help them come home. You know, some of us have family members in this situation. I have a couple family members that either were Christians or know what they were supposed to do to be Christians and haven't done so. But many of you may be in the same situation. So this lost son, this lost, is the person who knows the way, but we still need to encourage him to come. Let's talk about the older brother as we close. This older brother of this lost son. We don't talk about him a lot when we talk about this story. We talk about the forgiveness of the father. We talk about the penitent attitude of the son when he finally realized that he had gone astray. But sometimes we don't talk about this older brother. Now, this older brother, he had remained faithful to the father. He had worked for the father. <coughs> he had done what he's supposed to do, so to speak. He had paid his dues, we might say. He had been faithful and work. He stayed home. He stayed in the fold of God. He'd be like the Christian who stayed in the fold of God. He stayed in the fold of his father. But somewhere along the way, this older son, this older brother of the lost son, developed an attitude of self-righteousness at some point, of <coughs> feeling maybe that he was better than someone else. Now, he is another category of the lost. And he would be like the Christian who's not willing to forgive the brother who returns to God. He wasn't willing to forgive his brother who had come back to the father. He was upset that they were celebrating this son. He was upset that they were celebrating the fact that he came back and here he was, he had stayed the whole time and never got a celebration. He was jealous. He was angry. He was holding his brother's sins against him. He was holding his past against him. He wasn't seeing the brother for the person with the humble attitude that he had now. He was seeing that brother that <coughs> went astray before. He was more concerned with the fatted calf and getting his fair share than he was for the welfare of his brother. Let's hope that we never fall into that category. 
we should not fall into that category and have that attitude. And sometimes it's easy to do because we're human beings and we have memories and we remember maybe some things that a fellow Christian or a fellow brother or sister have done. And so when they come back to the fold, we might still remember those things that they did. But we need to try our best not to hold it against them. Because then we'd be like this older brother who held it against his younger brother when he came back. We need to be concerned with the welfare of others more than ourselves, unlike the older brother. Now, we've talked about four different types of the lost, so to speak. None of them are pleasing to the Father because the Father wants all people to be saved and not lost. We have some who are lost and don't even know it. They need to be taught. Maybe they're lost and they don't care that they're lost. They still need to be, they still need to be taught. We have some who, like the sheep, know they're lost, are worried about being lost, but don't know the way home. And so we show them the way home. We have those who know they're lost and know the way home, but need to feel like that there's that forgiving father waiting on them, just like the lost son. So we need to be that example. We need to be the one standing there with our arms open, bringing, willing to welcome him back. And not like the older son who is unwilling to forgive. All of these things are sometimes difficult to do. Sometimes it's difficult to go to the person who maybe thinks that they're okay or doesn't know that they're lost or doesn't care. Sometimes it's difficult to point out to them, you are lost. I care about you. I care about your soul. I want you to come back. Sometimes that's difficult because people don't like to hear those things sometimes, especially if they say they don't care about religion or their spirituality. They may not want to hear what you have to say. But it's still our obligation to attempt and to work diligently towards that goal. Sometimes it's difficult for the person who knows they're lost and must be taught the way home because sometimes it's hard to find them. Just like that sheep was probably pretty difficult to find. And sometimes it's hard to leave the 90 and 9 and go after the one because we want to protect the 90 and 9. But as Jesus the shepherd did for us, he died for all people, but he came to seek and save the lost, as the scripture was read this morning. Sometimes it's difficult for the person who knows they're lost, like that prodigal son. He knows they're lost, knows the way home. Sometimes it's difficult to get over our own feelings of maybe distrust towards that person, or maybe an unwillingness to forgive, to get that person to come home. But... God gives us his word. He gives us examples. And we are blessed to be able to read his word and to see the examples he has in here of forgiveness. To help us develop the attitude that we need to have. To develop the attitude of forgiveness and perseverance. To look for the lost. Some of us may know one person or maybe persons that fall into all these categories. What it's important for us to remember is, as the scriptures teach us, we need to look out for our own salvation and also look out for those who aren't saved. So first and foremost, the most important thing is to be sure that we are Christian to the best that we can be. It's to make sure that we are in a saved condition and a right relationship with God. And so what we do is, we always, <clears throat> when we assemble, offer an invitation to those who may be, for one or whatever reason, lost. Perhaps they're Christians who have fallen astray and are erring and need to come back in a public way. 
or those perhaps that are not a Christian, are not a child of God, and realize that they need to be a child of God. I, t- I attended a funeral this week. It was a relatively short funeral, but it was very appropriate because the lady was a Christian, and <coughs> the idea that, that, or the the tone of the funeral was that she was faithful. She fought her fought the fight. She ran the race, and she is in a better place. Her suffering is over. What we want to have said about us, hopefully at the end of our lives, is that we fought the fight, we ran the race, we were faithful unto death. But the first and the most important step is to be a Christian to begin with. And so when we look in the scriptures, we see the plan that God has laid out for us to be a child of his. We need to be willing to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And most people believe that. They believe in Jesus. Most. But also be willing to repent of our sins. You know, that prodigal son knew that he was in sin. But he didn't come back to the fold until he realized that and came to himself and repented. That means he changed his mind. That means he changed his way of life. He went back to the Father and had a willingness, if necessary, to make changes. You, you know, the lost son there said, I'll go back and be one of my father's hired servants. That was his attitude. I'll go back and be one of his hired servants. And when we are willing to repent of our sins, we come to the decision that we're not going to try to live in sin anymore, that we're going to try to change our ways and try to live by the scriptures whatever cost that may come to us. We need to be willing to do that. When we read in Acts 9, the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch, we read there that he had been taught these things by Philip, and he said, here is water, what hinders me to be baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So there we see an example of us being willing to make that confession. And by the way, as we live our Christian lives, we continue to make that profession that we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. If you're willing to take those steps and are willing to be baptized into Christ, immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins, this morning you can be a child of God. Luckily, that lost son had time to come back. Luckily, he had time to return to God. We're not not guaranteed that time. We're not guaranteed any amount of time. So the time is now to become a Christian. And we have the facilities here. We're ready, willing, and able to assist you if you wish to become a Christian this morning. And if you are a Christian but have strayed and have become lost and need to come back, and rededicate yourself to Christ in any way. We urge that you do so as we stand and sing.